guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models and Memories Weekly, episode 50. Models and Memories is a show about nothing and is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This is a show where I talk on painting, modeling, and wargame experiences from the week. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Jay, you put out three YouTube videos a week and you stream every single night. How? Could you possibly have more to say? Well, I do. And here it goes. This week, I actually got a lot of personal wargaming done. I finished my sister's novitiates painted live on stream, and I actually forgot to talk about, uh, I painted my Tempestus Scions live on stream. So I'm, I'm cranking out the kill teams, finally. And I also had a really fun week of trying to get my airbrushes to work. Airbrushes are, are a wargamer's best friend. I remember back in like 2013, Every single how to paint video on YouTube where somebody used the airbrush was just flooded with comments saying, no airbrush, how do you do it without the airbrush? Don't use an airbrush. And now it seems like they're pretty darn ubiquitous uh, just because they're so phenomenally useful for our hobby. But I actually had my Badger Patriot 105 crap out on me. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure I know why. Uh, because I used some Hops Number no. 9 Lubricating Gun Oil on my airbrush trigger, because uh, I thought that that would I thought that that would be a smart thing to do. Metal on metal contact, a little gun oil. It's probably the the cream of the crop uh, lubrication, but I'm it damaged my gasket. There's like a little phenolic plastic gasket in the body of the airbrush that the needle goes through and either it swelled from the oil or it the oil lubricated it so well that paint was able to flow back there and like clog and gunk up and damage that plastic seal. So now when I run air through this, air is, is kind of, it's getting out in other places because usually you're, the, the spraying action sucks paint from the reservoir, but I think it's not getting a very nice seal anymore. So I just need to replace that gasket. And then I think it'll be running just fine. But this is a fantastic airbrush, the Badger Patriot 105. And I also, because uh, because of how, how much this didn't work for me, I bought Badger's Needle Juice. And this stuff seems really, really good. Uh, you could, you're also supposed to put this on the needle and that helps, that helps minimize tip dry and minimize uh, paint, little paint chips clogging up between the nozzle and the needle. And so that seems to help a lot. And because this airbrush conked out on me, I decided instead of just buying the $5 replacement part, I decided to buy a whole new airbrush. <laughs> and I got myself a Badger Anthem 155. And this airbrush is pretty awesome. I don't know if this is the perfect airbrush. You know what? I think it is kind of the perfect airbrush for our applications. It has a humongous needle. I don't know, it's just like five millimeters. It's really, it's not five millimeters, it's like a howitzer. 0.5 millimeters. Um, but this really pushes the paint through. And I'd always heard, don't use a siphon feed. You can't use a siphon feed. The siphon feed uses up too much paint. It's not, it's not the perfect thing for our hobby. And that's kind of true. The, the regular the regular top pot is way better because you can use you can put in like a single drop of paint and then use it up where with with the cup you do kind of have to fill the reservoir up to a line before it'll start to spray but I think that this is what I will for now on spray on uh, varnishes and um, and primers holy cow does this put prime push primer just I could like I could paint my house with this thing it really puts out paint and it turns even even with with my Badger Patriot with the three millimeter nozzle this sprays paint really really fast too but this sprays it so much faster and like if I use my infinity CR plus with the 0.15 millimeter needle this would take me about five minutes to prime a model this takes about one minute to prime a model. This probably takes about 20 seconds to prime a model. So I'm, uh, I'm excited to add this to my repertoire. But now it's gonna become kind of an interesting thing where this, this airbrush has become my in-between 
If I want to really spray on details and highlights, I use my Infinity. And if I want to base coat, varnish, or prime, I'm gonna use my Badger Anthem. So when am I gonna pull out this sucker? I'll have to do a little bit more experimenting to see what I wanna do. I know if I throw a two millimeter needle into this, it would kind of replace the Infinity, although the Infinity is really nice. Although before you all go out and buy an Infinity, this airbrush is way too expensive. This is a $300 airbrush and it's very nice, but it's not like, I don't think it's $200 nicer than a really good $100 airbrush from Badger or Iwata. Uh, I think it's I think it's very very nice. The fit and finish is immaculate, but uh yeah, it's just it's too it's too much. I like mine, but uh I would I would suggest invest, investing in like a really nice like $120 Badger or uh, or, ne or Iwata if you really want a nice nice airbrush. But yeah, that is my airbrushing story. And the, the reason that I spent so long getting my airbrush to work is because I watched dozens of Marco Frisoni No Chos Meca videos. And it super got me jazzed to push my airbrushing to the absolute max. I feel like I go through cycles of barely touching the airbrush and then trying to use the airbrush a lot, but then going back to barely touching the airbrush, spray on a base coat and then just move all to brushwork but you can do a lot with the airbrush. I know I was watching Marco paint and he will have the airbrush like so close within a quarter inch of the model. And that's how you get really, really accurate and precise with it. And so that is how I painted these models and they turned out really, really nice. And they, they painted up fairly quickly I think usually for me, I can do a good paint job in three hours. That's fast. If I'm really putting the pedals to the metal, I can finish a paint job in about three hours. But all of these models took less than three hours each. The eight Tempestus Scions for an all, for an oops, all Scion kill team, I spent 10 hours painting these eight models and I absolutely love them. They are almost 100% painted with the airbrush. The only thing I brushed on is they have a couple of brown straps. I painted those with the brush and I put contrast paints on the little straps on their backpack. And uh, I airbrushed on a an object source lighting coming out of their visor, uh, although that was with the airbrush too. And then I I also used the airbrush to glaze on the. Uh, so yeah, I didn't I did not use the brush for almost anything. One thing I did use the brush for was applying metallics to a few of their little skulls and uh, Aquila emblems. But these models I absolutely adore. I love how they came out. And so I decided to do the exact same thing on my sister's Novitiates. And I think they turned out really, really well as well. The only thing was for with these ladies is that the color was a little bit of a surprise for me. I went in with like a vision of doing like purple and so I, I, I airbrushed on purple and then I airbrushed on green onto the cloaks with the with the intention of covering it up more with black to make it kind of a, a dark green black. And I definitely think it worked because the, the, the big trick I learned is you put on your base coat and then you apply a white highlight with white ink and you can really create nice highlights and then you cover it again with this with ink. And I think the inks I used on these ladies were a little bit too dark. I wanna find a medium, like a paint medium that I can put into my inks to dilute them a little bit more. And then I think I'll have a little bit more control in the colors I end up with. But overall, I'm super duper satisfied with these ladies. The Tempesta Scions took 10 hours and the, sis the 10 Sisters Novitiates, actually 12 Sisters Novitiates took uh, 15 hours to paint. And, I, and it's 12 because I also have, uh, I, I used a, a Sister Repentia model for my Novitiate Repentia. And then I also created this little banner for the secondary objective um, where you have to plant the little banner in the enemy territory, which is a super, super fun, just a super, super fun ability. I also got a chance to play my Sister Novitiates. I have been doing my best in Kill Team, but I think jumping from kill team to kill team to kill team to kill team has finally caught up with me in that I don't win many or any games of kill team. 
but I think I had my best game in a while with the Cistern Novitiates. I really studied them and I learned them and I made myself a cheat sheet of what to do when certain events happen in the game, which models to activate first, which models to activate last. And so I think I played pretty darn well. By turn two, I had eight points and my opponent only had two. So I, I was like, I was doing super, super good. The only problem is my sisters were dying really, really fast and I got wiped off the board in turn three. And so the final score was me with 10 points and my opponent with 16. Uh, and I was wiped off the board and he still had most of his models. But, but I learned a lot and I'm gonna come back stronger and eventually I will be undefeatable with my sister's novitiates because I really do think they're a very, very fun kill team. And they're also a kill team, I think that it's, um, you're kind of almost meant to die but win in points because they're very, very fragile. They don't have a lot of good shooting. In fact, the only good shooting they have on the team um, is the uh, the silent crossbow and the the sergeant's plasma pistol. Those are the only good guns in the game. Everything else is close combat. But the sisters novitiates risk the biscuits with close combat because what you really want in close combat is you want like a power sword or a power claw, something that does like six or eight damage in one punch so you can one punch stuff to death. Where the Sisters Novitiates, they can very easily land all their hits. So if they're swinging four times, they're going to get four hits. It's really easy using their faith point system and stuff to bump that. So you get like, I got three criticals in a normal hit, beat that. And then my opponent is just like, okay, well, I'll punch you. And then you punch back for four. And then I'll punch you again and your sister dies. And it didn't matter that you got all those hits off. But I'm learning, I'm learning and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna figure out exactly how to play them. It seems like the, the best way to do it would probably be to somehow wound my opponent before getting into close combat with them. So I might actually have to play around with some of the stratagems that let my guns be a little bit better. And maybe I just, I just sp spend turn one and two maybe whittling down my opponents. You know, just knocking off a couple of wounds could definitely turn the tide of, of getting into close combat. Cause yeah, a sister novitiate getting into combat with a fresh orc boy, it's, it's, uh, it's it takes a, it takes a few punches to punch through those ten wounds. But I'm super duper excited, and I can't wait to finish painting the last few members of my Tempesta Scion team. Although I'm gonna hold off on playing them because I really want to get good with my sister's novitiates. I am excited, and I even have more kill teams in the work. And I actually just bought another kill team. <laughs> But this is all going to be cool because we are still working on battle reports. We really are. Uh, it, it may seem like we're not, but we are. And the reason it seems like we're not is because we really don't have much time. We put out four YouTube videos a week. We stream every single night. Every, like, we spend so, 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 so much time creating the normal videos for the channel that we just have to kind of find little times throughout the day in our free time to work on battle reports. But we have lots of really, really fun ideas. And Kill Team is gonna be a huge part of those battle reports. And my dream, my vision, is to have a giant wheel, kind of like at a carnival, where you have to pick a number and they spin it. And on this wheel is just Kill Team, Kill Team, Kill Team, Kill Team, Kill Team, Kill Team. And, you'll gra and we'll grab this wheel at the start of the game and we'll give it a spin. And whatever it lands on is the Kill Team that you have to play with. I think that that would be beyond fun and be and it would also kind of help the game, I think, be a little bit more casual because that's kind of our play style here is a little bit more casual. I think that's most people's play styles, honestly. I know we're constantly inundated with, you know, oh, well, this took, you know, first place at this, you know, you know, grand tournaments. This is, you know, the, the new Tau Codex is destroying tournament lists. But really, most people just play with the models they have and the friends they have and whatever happens, happens. I don't know, how often does it really matter what the meta is? And ah, uh, the meta. Who even cares? The the dumbest thing in the world is the Warhammer, is the Warhammer Articles Meta Watch, where Games Workshop, the publishers of the rules, talk about how the rules are doing. Like, it's so dumb. Like the, the only thing that really matters with, with the meta should be how are things going in people's games. And you can't really get a sense of that because there's no way to really know. It would almost be more interesting if there was an app, maybe a Warhammer app, maybe the Warhammer app, where 
everybody could just, you know, honor system, just publish the results of their game. Like, oh, I played, you know, I played my nephew. We, you know, Necrons versus my Space Marines and he won. So I'm going to give Necrons a point. And then you just get millions of, of data references, maybe not millions, <laughs> thousands of data references to really kind of get a sense of not only what's winning, but how many people are playing that army. Because definitely one thing you see a lot of in in uh, those competitive roundups is usually like Space Marines and Necrons do fairly poorly because so many more people are playing them because they're super popular armies. And often you'll see things like Gene Stealer Cult and Harlequins doing really, really well because those armies are more niche. And so a lot fewer people are playing them. And so a few people playing really, really well kind of overshadows situations where there's tons of amazing Space Marine players, but also tons of really bad Space Marine players. And so they kind of level each other out. I think, I don't know, I think war games aren't, at least 40K is not a competitive war game. It's almost a role playing game. And I just think it is the dumbest thing to really invest in the, uh, in, in the competitiveness of this game that has three, thousand individual units that can all be that can all be customized however you want like you know chess the only the only advantage in chess is the white checkers checkers the white chess pieces get to go first you know chess is an almost perfectly balanced game whereas 40k is the most perfectly unbalanced game you can do whatever you want the list building literally allows for almost anything and if the list building doesn't allow for it, you can just decide, you can just agree with your opponent. I'm going to set up the stuff I have and you set up the stuff you have and we'll make them fight. And that's, and that's how, and then we'll get some pizza. That's most games. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. But in other Wargaming news, I watched a really, really interesting video from Auspex Tactics. Uh, I really like Auspex Tactics, which is funny because I just railed against competitive play forever. And Auspex is all about like competitive and how models are doing. But I really kind of like how he breaks stuff down because he does, he gives a good, a good basis of knowledge for units and things. And what I really like is he usually talks about things in a way that doesn't break it down into math. Because one thing I really like in my tactics videos and stuff is I don't really like when they get into the math of it because it's, I don't know, for me, it takes all the fun out of it. I want to hear someone's opinion. I don't want to hear the facts. <laughs> don't try to confuse me with numbers and charts. <laughs> I just, I just want someone's hunch. But, uh, but it was a really interesting video, not about tactics, but about he looked back through all of the Games Workshop doubles boxes that they've made for Warhammer 40K. And I didn't really realize how many there were. Um, I think, uh, and it was really interesting. He, he took every single box and then he based it. He took the, the original price and then made it into, you know, modern, the modern price of $200 and then looked at the, the comparative value for each boxes. And they've all actually been fairly consistent. I always assumed that the old boxes were amazing value and the newer boxes are kind of yeah, whatever value, but they've all been fairly consistent. Some of the earlier ones were a little bit better than some of the newer ones we've gotten, but it was really, it was, I thought it was a really, really interesting video. I look back through all of these different boxes and seeing like what came in them, which boxes had like a lot of really appealing models, which boxes maybe didn't, which boxes, uh, I know the, uh, the, the piety and pain box that sold out in like 15 seconds versus some of the other boxes that really stuck around for a long time. Uh, the only doubles boxes I've bought, I bought the Space Wolves versus Gene Stealer Cult box because that gave me my first Redemptor Dreadnought and uh, some extra Primaris Intercessors. I didn't end up building the Space Wolf character because I don't play Space Wolves, but I super, super wanted the Gene Stealer Cult in the brand new Plastic Aberrants box. The Gene Stealer Cult Aberrants are one of my favorite models that Games Workshop has ever made. I remember I bought multiple sets of the Aberrant, of the four Aberrants that came in Death Watch Overkill. Like I bought like 10. And then as soon as the plastic kit came out, I bought two more boxes <laughs> so that I could have all of these different poses. I have entirely too many Aberrants and they've never really been good in the game, but I'm very excited to have a couple of Goliath trucks completely full of Aberrants, just push up the table and let them out. It's going to be glorious. 
Um, is that the only doubles box I've bought? Yeah, that box. Ah, not, it wasn't Forge Bane. Forge Bane was the Necron one. But whatever that box was, that was the only one I bought. But it was, it was, it was, I thought it was a really, really interesting video. And it made me think about these double boxes because 200 buccarinos is a lot of money. And I would, I would caution anybody who's looking at these boxes, only buy the doubles boxes with a pal. I really don't think a single person should buy the $200 doubles box. Maybe if you know you're a quick painter, you know you love every single model in the kit, you have both of those armies and these will supplement them perfectly. Maybe then it's a really, really good fit for you. But I think the way to go with these double boxes is to have a friend. Maybe somebody who is thinking about getting into wargaming or is like slowly getting into wargaming. And then all of a sudden you can be like, hey, well, they just came out with this new box that's got Gene Stealers and Grey Knights or Gene Stealers and Adeptus Custodes. I know you're really into the Adeptus Custodes. So maybe we go have these. We both get a nice little discount. We get to be in this together. And then eventually we're going to have both of these, both of the halves of this box all built up. And then we can, you can, you know, fight each other and it'll be great. and It'll be super fun. And, you know, we can text message back and forth like, oh, I just put together this model. Well, I just put together that model. I think that is how to truly get, get your money's worth out of these boxes because it's, um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of not having a pile of shame because I have a big pile of shame and it stinks. I always, I, every single time I buy a new mini, which is kind of a lot, every time I buy a new mini, I have a little a twinge of guilt that I am not painting all of the models that I own because I loved all of those models that I bought. All of them came with excitement and fun and now they're sitting in a cardboard box, not getting work done. So I think if there's anything you can do to not purchase more than you need, I think you should definitely do it because just imagine, imagine how much fun it would be if the pile of shame was at the friendly local game store and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're free. You don't have any, you're not trapped under plastic and you can just wander into the game store with a wallet full of cash and just wander past all the beautiful boxes on the shelf and pick yourself out something nice. That, that I think is what, what should happen in Wargaming, but it so often doesn't. So be careful with these Games Workshop doubles boxes. And, uh, and if you want to live vicariously, I would say watch Auspex Tactics video and just look at all of the pretty boxes and all of the different contents. And uh, there is some, there is some that I didn't even remember. I did not remember uh, one box that now I would probably be super into, which was Harlequins versus the um, Death Watch Space Marines. I don't know how that one slipped past me. I guess I wasn't as into the Harlequins like two years ago as I am now, because now I would totally have picked up that box just to give myself enough models for and initially to start out as a kill team. And Harlequins, you don't need that many models. So I could have easily bumped that up with the remaining the remaining pieces in the box into uh, a, a small 40K force. But that, that was one that just completely slipped past me. It was probably during my architecture days where I did not have one second of free time. Holy cow. It was a really, really interesting video and I really got a kick out of it. It'll also be really interesting to see with Games Workshop's new price hike, which is going into effect March 7th. Um... Will the doubles boxes get even more expensive? Because Auspex had the original prices in all of his videos. And you can see, you know, it just goes up and up and up and up and up. Is it going to plateau at 200 for a little while? Maybe a couple of years? Or are we going to see it go up to like 210 in the next box that they release? It'll be really interesting to see. I hope, I mean, obviously everybody hopes that the price doesn't go up. But uh, it might. It might. But... I am super satisfied with what I worked on this week. I'm really excited to continue using my airbrushes to the best of their ability. And I'm really, really liking base coating with the airbrush because I, I can't stand base coating. I just do not like it. Sitting there with a brush, just painting brown on the clothing and then black on the boots and then blue on the hair. It's just, it's no fun at all because it is the before step. It's like, it's like a tax to get to do the fun things like glazing and dry brushing and highlighting and, and edge highlighting, you know, eyes, faces, freehanding. All of those painting things are really, really fun, especially because they're kind of, they're not quite finishing touches, but they all happen in the, in towards the end of a paint job. Whereas the beginning parts of a paint job are usually not much fun. Like, you know, you paint the entire, you paint the big cloak brown, 
but really you know you're gonna cover almost all of that brown with another color. But if you have the airbrush, that brown goes on real quick. You can even add some, some basic value highlights and shadows with the airbrush too. And so I'm definitely really looking forward to getting a lot more use out of my airbrushes and hopefully remove hours and hours and hours of frustrating, annoying base coating and getting to replace that with more time spent doing the things I actually enjoy with painting. And the more time that I can give myself, because usually I'm, I'm kind of impatient with painting where uh, I want to get to the good stuff and then I also want to get to the end as quickly as possible. And so sometimes I won't take a model as far as I could have. But with base cut, with, uh, with the airbrush taking away so many hours of painting, I'm not feeling as bogged down. And so then I can put more time into my models. In fact, I can kind of prove it with these Tempesta Scions. I was, before I knew it, the models were pretty much done. And so I actually took the time to painstakingly freehand a little grid onto their little their little iPad they got attached to their to their arms. And if I had had if you know, if I was finishing these models at the end of like 30 hours, I probably would have just left it with a green glow and just left it up to my imagination what's on their little screens. But because I finished the model so quick, I didn't mind spending like an extra hour painting on, you know, a many, many, many little tiny grids and glazing. And I put on little dots all over the place. I really, I really had a good time. And that is because of the airbrushes. And speaking of a good time because of the airbrushes, I barely used Games Workshop paint pots. And if you also want to say no to pots, we have merch. We have a Say No to Pots t-shirt and a futuristic space soldier with no relationship with 40K whatsoever in t-shirts and very comfortable sweaters. And if t-shirts aren't your thing, we also have a Patreon, which is the best way to support us. And on the Patreon, you'll get access to one extra episode of EOB a week, some a whole bunch of terrain STLs, a weekly Friday night hobby hangout, and more. But with that said, that was my week of hobbying, and it'll bring this episode of Models and Memories to a close.